beauty is truth. We've discussed the Enlightenment and theories about how how can you know the truth, what to know. Mm. This seems to be asserting that the, the truth is known subjectively, that if you have feelings of love or you're moved by the beauty of an idea, that in itself is proof that it's true in some sense. Is that is that right? Is that what's being asserted? I, I think it probably is right. It's interesting in the poem that that statement is put in the mouth of a personified urn. This uh, is a kind of coffin. It's a kind of coffin of the Greek world people were buried in. That's right. That's jars. right. I, th- I didn't know that myself until quite recently. So we, 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 we have that kind of sloganistic statement, beauty is truth, truth is beauty, put in inverted commas in the poem itself. And then the speaker in the poem rounds the whole thing off by saying, that is all ye know on earth and all ye need to know. And I'm sort of emphasising that second person singular ye in the wording of the poem. Uh, which bears out, I think, your suggestion that um, the subjective element is what is paramount in terms of interpreting and making sense of this sloganistic uh, affirmative statement, beauty is truth. But isn't it also the statement, beauty is truth, somewhat dangerous? Because, um, to me, it brings to mind consumerism, which is sort of enjoying enjoying money, enjoying what we have and just buying more and more and just um, materialism as well, consumerism and materialism which um, could also be said to be the sort of poison of the modern life and so uh, I'm not entirely convinced by his assertion that uh, beauty is truth and truth is beauty is in itself a truth. It would be an interesting experiment, wouldn't it, to to run that Keats slogan, beauty is truth. Truth, beauty is kind of a caption in a TV commercial for hair hair dye or whatever it might be. And I I wonder whether you could make it work or whether there would be some perception of the difference of one definition of beauty associated with Jennifer Aniston, L'Oreal because you're worth it and Keats concentrating on that Grecian urn and coming up with beauty is truth truth beauty there will be a perception I think of of two different notions of beauty being at stake in that comparison of a TV commercial and the Keats ode Um, I think it's just worth just pointing out at the end uh, because we've only touched on Emmanuel Kant very Briefly, this idea of uh, truth, which came across uh, very, um, uh, it was very important in Kant's philosophy, especially in his uh, his uh, categorical imperative. Uh, his, I believe, it was his second maxim, if I'm right, was that uh, truth is that that should be all there is. There should be no. Uh, was it that you can never lie to anyone else? It has to be true all the time. Everything you say. There's a universal law, and I'm just trying to remember. Just trying to bring in some well, aspect of that. He claims that, that you have an instinct within you, so you might not know the truth about any matter. It, it, but his, his philosophy is more to do with honesty, subjective feeling, being honest. That So when, when, Keat, when uh, Keats is saying truth is beauty, this is a purely honest, you know, a kind of pure honesty in uh, rather than an objective scientific fact about it. I mean, you, you couldn't know simply, oh, I really think that that's 17 centimetres. I've got a really strong instinct that it's 17 centimetres long. I mean, you'd go and measure that. Um, but the act of measuring it would have to be pure and honest. So, and Kant asserts that within you, all people, he's asserting this as part of the category of him, know when they are being honest and they know when they're being dishonest. Mm. Now, I generally come at philosophy from more of an empiricist point of view, but I have to say that I find this to be true in my own personal experience, that one is inescapably aware of when is, one is trying to be honest, yeah. dishonest, even if one is acting dishonestly. Mm. Even if you tell your children, for example, that there is Father Christmas, you know that that's a dishonest act. You might well still do it and build some ideas around it. Yeah. But this seems to me to be very important in Kant, uh, and uh, and in the subjectivity that's in, implied in, in, for instance, that, that poem. Yes. Well, we'll put oneself in a very impoverished position uh, 
that is sort of implied by that maxim seeing is believing uh, there are so many things that exist and you can't see them uh, so many things that we've been referring to uh, together in a more or less abstract w w way in terms of this discussion around the table this afternoon um, yeah, to say it again you you'd be a really rather impoverished human being if you absolutely held to the letter I think of that cardinal empiricist uh, axiom that you can only believe in what you see uh, and it might not just be Father Christmas who was the case in point in that regard yes okay well I think that we've uh, uh, chewed this over quite quite well any any last comments particularly from the students any last words on uh, romantic romanticism if not George if you're going to sum it up, what, what your, your current thinking on uh, just, on the just what's in just what's in my head at the moment. I'm just yes. thinking, just mulling over my head. It's quite interesting how uh, well we consider to be a uh, uh, you're saying about the industrial revolution and very much about the enlightenment. How that came out of what just from how I understand romanticism to be that uh, uh, that pa uh, kind of the use of passion in your thinking. I think it's quite interesting that. The entire and the Enlightenment, so so to speak, came out of a uh, kind of a romantic idea of uh, needing to break free from the dogma of what was the Dark Ages, and uh, yeah, it's quite a romantic idea of uh, breaking free from that, and that that then spawned what we uh, have kind of been discussing as very separate mm. as the empirical and the industrial. Mm. I think that that's quite interesting to point out. There's a very convenient phrase, isn't there? The dialectic of en enlightenment it covers everything you've just been referring to, I think, which was kind of put into the language in the 1940s, Adorno and Adorno and Horkheimer. Yes. And the jury is out, I think, in, ter in terms of how accurately to interpret that dialectic. First, it goes in one direction, positive direction, then in the negative direction. Certainly for Adorno and Horkheimer, in the 1940s, they saw the gas chambers as a, a logical culmination to uh, developments that started to take place in the Enlightenment itself. Indeed, the ecological problem. Yeah. Uh, very good. But we present for the Enlightenment uh, the, the, the thing we study is Machiavelli. So uh, he's probably the least romantic uh, person for practical purposes that, that we could look at. So the contrast is there. Mm -hmm. Ali? Um, summing up? Uh, well, summing up, or do you broad mean... Thoughts broad thoughts? Well, broad mm -hmm. thoughts, I'd say. Um, I initially asked, uh, does the answer that it's too soon to, set, to tell what the effects of the French Revolution are, is that still true? And uh, we came to talk about the painting of Prometheus. And uh, while I was talking about that, I sort of formula formulated an answer to that question myself, which was um, when I was talking about Prometheus looking forward, sort of looking towards, I, mean, I might, might just be misremembering sort of sun, sunrise, sort of new future. And in that way, it sort of creates a universal theme of... Uh, Oh, of there being a sort of constant newness uh, to it, if that makes sense. I think that then links in with what is going on in the Middle East mm. today. And um, furthermore, uh, I just I just think it's quite an amusing thing talking about Ozymandias today and Colonel Gaddafi also. Um, I was reading The Independent earlier today and. Robert Fisk's article was about Colonel Gaddafi's regime and how it's coming to an end and so on. Mm. And uh, one thing that he said uh, that he reported came to mind as we were talking about Ozymandias, and that is that uh, Colonel Gaddafi spent 20 minutes of the four hours he had with the public talking to an old friend of his about uh, where he can get a good facelift. And I think that in itself, it, it, that personifies the myth or perhaps the history of Ozymandias beauty is entire. truth beauty is truth yes. that's a very good point though mm. the insanity of, of tyranny and 
Uh, back to my original question about has romanticism like affected you know, current events. I can see that the way the revolutionaries are acting, they're not coldly considering their actions, they're acting out in passion. So it's very much still prevalent today. And um, I don't know, I'm just glad that it is. I'm glad that people don't walk around like robots, you know, empirically observing every single event. Yes. Yeah. I'm really pleased that I've been able to come along today to uh, answer your questions. In the earlier talk that I gave, probably for pedagogic reasons, I wanted to accentuate the positive, some of which uh, have just been uh, summarised by Felicity. Um, but in, in terms of being pressed a little bit more closely this afternoon, uh, it's clear, and I'm, I'm glad that you've seen this also, that there are other aspects to that central Prometheus myth which I wanted to rehearse, which don't always have quite such positive uh, uh, associations and connotations uh, and so I think you know, in light of the discussion we've had further this afternoon we've got a fuller understanding and grasp of what that total Prometheus myth looks like Well thanks very much uh, for that I found it a very interesting discussion and I'm very grateful Gary that you could come along uh, and uh, field all these questions at short notice and, um, and do so so, uh, so cogently uh, Ali, George, Felicity, thanks as well. And thanks to you, the listeners, for tuning in to this series in the History of Ideas here at the University of Winchester, part of the History and Context of Journalism series. We'll be back soon with uh, more discussions. And so, once again, thanks to everybody. Thanks to the listeners. Cheerio. <laughs>